on this episode of Wrestling Changed My Life with Coach Mike Gray. Ah, wrestling made me who I am. You know, it taught me how to fight through adversity. It taught me what a, you know, a, a day's work is, what a hard day's work is. You know, it made me who I am. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time I spent wrestling, if it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. My friends, my sisters, my brethren, welcome back to another episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. This is your host, Ryan Warner. My guest today is Mike Gray, associate head coach at Cornell, coaching the likes of Yanni D, Nishan, Max Dean, Kyle Dake, the list goes on. There's a ton of studs up there in Ithaca, New York. And as an athlete, Coach Gray was New Jersey's first four-time state champ. He was also a two-time All-American for Cornell. Enjoy the conversation. He's an awesome guy, and I can't wait for y'all to listen to this episode. Fan of the week goes to Steve Bozak, a fellow Cornellian. He was a national champ for Cornell, and I'm flattered to know that Mr. Bozak tunes in to this podcast, and I know he'll be listening to the interview with Mike Gray here. So thank you for listening, Steve. Greatly appreciated. Last but not least, no sponsorship or ad readings this time, but I did want to let you know that the company I work for, F5 Networks, we're hiring an outside sales rep in Dallas. So if you have experience, let me know. I can put you in touch with the right people. And that goes for anyone who's maybe kind of first out of college or maybe you're in college and don't know what you want to do. Sales is a great career. I'm always happy to chat and share my advice and put you in touch with some people to help you along your way. So just let me know. You can find me on our website, wrestlingchangemylife.com, on Twitter under Ryan Warner, as well as Instagram under Wrestling Change My Life. Give me a shout, folks. And that's it. Let's give it up for the great Mike Gray. Peace. Mike Gray, welcome to the podcast, my friend. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. How are things out in Ithaca, New York this morning? Uh, they are great. So we just finished up. Uh, we had NC State on Saturday. We had the Cornell Open on uh, Sunday. So we're, our guys are, you know, doing a little lifting and just recovering today. And then we'll get back after it uh, tomorrow. So, so things you, are good. Do you guys take some time off during Thanksgiving or does everybody stick around? Um, so this year we're sticking around because we wrestle Ohio State on Sunday. Oh, so wow. we wrestle Ohio State on uh, December 1st. So. Uh, our our ten starters will stick around. Um, we'll have Thanksgiving dinner at my house. My wife's going to make a big old dinner, uh, probably for me mostly. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but no. So you know, it'll be fun. We'll have uh, um, my wife, my my in laws are coming up as well. Um, so so that'll be a lot of fun. It'll be great to have all the guys there. They can hang out with uh, my little boy Declan. So it'll be uh, you know a family affair for sure. Man, I I really got that when I was talking with with Gabe Dean, it's just a family atmosphere at Cornell. The culture seems, seems really unique like that. Everyone's really tight knit. And, and I see pictures on your you know Instagram and Twitter about kind yeah. of all the guys hanging yeah. out at your house. So that's pretty cool. You guys have that there. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's ter- like unique. I think a lot of places think that they have, uh, you know, good, that good family environment, but for me, it really hits home because, uh, you know, like I said, I got a 16 month old little boy and, um, you know, I, I want to make sure he's surrounded by the best people. Um, you know what I mean? And, and that's, that's the one thing that we have here at Cornell is we just have great, great people, uh, from wrestlers to administrators to other, you know, fellow coaches, just, you know, and then obviously the Ithaca community. So, um, 
we're really lucky to, and I'm really lucky to have been, you know, been in Ithaca for 14 years now and to be able to raise a little boy and, you know, start a family and all that good stuff in Ithaca. It's been definitely been a blessing. Man, that's, it's awesome to hear in terms of like the people outside the program. And I really got that yeah. when I was interviewing, uh, I interviewed Kevin Ward from Army and then BJ Futrell from Navy. And those institutions mm-hmm. both seem, you know, I know they're service academies, but like you think about the coaches or instructors, those guys are rubbing elbows with like five star generals. Yeah. Yeah, at, yeah. 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 At the same time, though, you are as well. I mean, you're at a, a super high level Ivy League athletic uh, institution and some of the professors there and just the, the alumni must be just top, top level performers across the board. Yeah. No, is it, you're, you're surrounded, you know, I think the best way to be successful is to surround yourself by, you know, successful people, right? Um, you know, and, and that just drives the motivation through the roof in, in whatever environment you're in. And that's kind of, you know, our motto here. Um, you know, we have, we're surrounded by some wonderful students, some, some really impressive professors, uh, you know, some, some great uh, advisors, just a lot of people that have su- succeeded in a lot of different fields, um, you know, in, in their life. And when you bring all those people together, it only, you know, raises the room. And, and it makes the room even better. And that's kind of, um, you know, what we have going at Cornell, um, at the university, especially in Cornell wrestling. And then in, in, in the, uh, you know, in Ithaca as well. And the great thing about our program is that, you know, not to say that other programs are fair weather fans, um, but Rob has been here for 31 years. So he's developed relationships with these folks for so, you know, for so long and, 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 and built these relationships so strong that, um, you know, that, that, that they're, they can stand the, stand the test of time, you could say. You know, they're, the, the folks are invested in, in not just who's wrestling this weight class. They're invested in the program as a whole. They, they come out to support our guys, obviously, but they come out to support Cornell Wrestling more than anything. And that's, uh, that's something that's really neat and that I've seen continue to grow in, you know, in, uh, over my time at Cornell. And it's been, it's been a lot of fun to see the growth, for sure. Well, I was going to ask you about that because your fans have been spoiled with really dominant teams over the past 10, 15 years. I mean, yeah, one of the perennial contenders every year. But this year, there's a lot of Olympic red shirts, and rightly so. But you know, does it doesn't seem like the fans are turning out any less because you know the the top guys aren't in there. They seem like they're still coming just to support the program. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like I said, our fans are loyal. They they understand, uh, you know, what we stand for as a program, uh, you know, things we believe in and, and you know, the, like Gabe, Gabe spoke about the culture we have and, and, and they're behind that. Um, but the other thing too is, um, you know, us as a program, this is, this is why you coach, you know what I mean? This, this is, this is a challenge as a coach and something that I look forward to seeing our team build throughout the year. Um, you know what I mean? We still think that we're in the driver's seat um, in the Ivy league and we, you know, we still think we're, we can be in the driver's seat in the EIWAs, right? Um, obviously, other people disagree with us. Um, <laughs> we're, we're a bit biased. By, we're, we're a bit biased to our camp, but that that that's why you coach. You know what I mean? Obviously, you coach to help help these guys. You know, just become better men and and develop great life skills and all that good stuff. But the actual, you know, coaching on the mat. That's why you coach to make guys better, to to watch them jump levels and to be a better version of themselves at the, at the end of the year when it counts than they are right now. So, yeah, I mean, we, we didn't wrestle great against NC state and uh, you know, it is what it is, but we can't dwell on it and we're going to, you know, work our butts off. We got, we have a great challenge coming up. Uh, you know, we have Ohio state on Sunday. That's a great challenge. And then we go to Vegas. So I think that there's, you know, something to be said about us starting our schedule so strong and then wrestling some really tough teams um, that wrestle a certain way because it's only going to make us better, th- you know, d- down the road. And then that's kind of, that's kind of what we were thinking going, uh, NC state, Ohio state, and then Vegas, you know, and then going to Southeast duels and wrestling teams like Missouri, you know, that, that, that's a perennial tough team. Um, you know, before we settle into our Ivy league schedule a bit. So it, our schedule has always kind of been, um, you know, mixed like that, having ups and downs in, in the sense of, uh, you know, different levels of competition. And, and we like that. And we think that that works well for us. And, um, you know, obviously it was a tough go uh, on Saturday, but like I said, we have, we, we have faith in our guys and we have faith in our coaching abilities and, um, and our fans, I guess, bringing it back to the question, yeah. our fans have faith in us as well. And that's how, uh, and that's why they still come to our matches because they know that, we're going to, you know, I like to say, well, we're going to earn our money this year. <laughs> you know what I, mean? 
in I, the sense that we have we, we have guys that are great. We just got to polish them up and make sure that they're feeling good and, and, and allow them to be great. Well, man, I got to tell you, the amount of guys I've had on the show who went on to be national champs but came into the program with 500 records as a, as a true freshman and kind of developed over time is more the norm than someone coming in yeah. like a Yanni. So to your point, these are the years where you got to get excited because, you know, Maybe you don't have some of the headline names, but you're still working with them every day and hopefully getting them Absolutely. to jump levels, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is – our guys are getting better right now. And, and more than anything, um, our guys are getting opportunities that they wouldn't have if, yet, you know, the Maxes, the the Yannis, and, and Beto and Barry Issa were in there, right? Mm-hmm. So our team is getting stronger as a whole right now um, because other guys are ha- are having to step up, right? Next man up mentality. And that's, that's what we have this year where – you know, granted, you know, some guys wouldn't be stars, but they are now. So next year, it's only going to make our room that much stronger because you have, you know, two or three guys at a weight class that are, you know, that, that have had experience and, and are and are developed in, in you know, in, in this in this scenario and are ready to wrestle. So I think I think as a whole, it's going to help our program. And I know that we're going to be very, very tough in, in the, you know, the years to come. But that doesn't mean that we're not focusing on being successful this year and we're not you know, dedicated to the task of working our tails off to make sure our guys are ready to scrap. And that's, that's the biggest thing, right? You know, don't, don't sell the farm this year, work your butt off and, you know, do a good job and, and, and get the success you want with a squad that people don't think are, you know, as good or as strong as years past, make it work, find a way to make it work. Well, man, you got to think that's what Coach Cole had to deal with every year for the first 10 to 15 years, man. <laughs> Those guys are like, you know, wrestling yeah. with the chip on the shoulder, yeah, yeah. not expecting much. And then next thing you know, yeah. it's one of the top five programs every single year, if not the top program every single year. So it's just exciting to yeah. see that, uh, see those kind really of up, ups and downs, you know, because Coach Cole did that mm-hmm. for a long time there. Yeah, he did. And, uh, you know, I think that for us, it's, it's good. Um, you know, it, it's a great challenge, but, um, the, the, the biggest thing, no matter what is belief in our guys, you know, and I don't care, you know, where we're at, I'm always going to believe in our guys and believe in, you know, their ability and believe in our ability to, you know, get them, get them to where they need to be. And, uh, you know, I, I, th- I think we will do that. And I know that they'll be ready to go, uh, when the, when the lights are on for sure. So I'm excited, you know, it's a different type of feel of a year, but you know, the, the goal has never changed, right? The goal is to make your team as the best it can be. It doesn't matter where that is. You know, if you can get the most out of your team, that's, that's the goal. And then, you know, trying to motivate them to, um, you know, get a hundred percent out of themselves. That's the goal every year. And, you know, that never changes. It never changes and, and will never change. Right. That's, that's the goal of a coach, um, you know, in the, in the wrestling side of it, at least. And one of the things kind of to your point about the self-belief in your guys, one of the things that jumped out to me from the first time we talked was, you know, at a young age, your dad had that kind of belief in you and your brothers. And, yeah, you know, even if there wasn't the uh, the mat work to kind of back up, you know, kind of evidence that. And so maybe to shifting mm-hmm. gears, take us take us way back to your childhood, man, and what your, your family life was like growing up and kind of how you got involved with the sport just to begin with. Yeah, um, you know, so my dad wrestled in high school. Uh, my grandpa wrestled. My dad wrestled. Um, for a good bit, but then they cut in the hunting season, so he, he quit wrestling. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so my dad's a big hunter, you know, just a tough blue collar guy. Um, you know, and my mom as well. She's so she uh, started off working as a hospice nurse, and then um, she went to, um, you know, like hospital, I guess administration. So like some some type of administration uh, master master program at Rutgers Night School. So she got her master's in hospital administration or something along those lines. Um, and then she went into the business side of, uh, you know, uh, of hospice. So she started and took over a hospice that was, uh, you know, really small, had a couple patients, had a couple employees and, and, uh, grew it to, you know, many, many employees. And, uh, you know, and then they got, I think they stretched like 20 States or something. So, um, that's kind of like my parents' story about how, um, they kind of get going. My dad worked worked for New, New Jersey natural gas for, uh, 30 years or so. So, um, you know, they're both retired now, but, but, you know, I guess, but back to the, the story and the, and the, and the question, right. Uh, that type of workmanship, right. And the ability to work their, work their tails off every day and to, 
um, you know, keep coming back for more. That's what they um, instilled in us, instilled in my older brother, John, who's, uh, you know, an attorney now and does a great job. He, he's, you know, really, really tough in, in, in his, uh, in, in his area. Right. And then obviously myself and Mark, uh, you know, we were just raised in with, with, uh, with a tough set of parents. And, you know, we, we learned what, what hard work was at, at a young age and we learned, uh, you know, the, the great ability of staying power, right. S- sticking with the plan and continuing to come back every day and, you know, keep chopping the tree down and eventually it'll go, you know, you, you'll, you'll get it down you know, just that type of mentality where, um, you know, you might, you might not get what you want every day, but you got to keep working. Um, you know, you got to keep getting better and you got to keep trying to positively affect those around you. And then you'll, you'll get, you'll get what's coming to you. Right. Um, you know, you, you'll, you'll get, you'll get a reward of sorts. It might not be exactly what you want, but you're going to end up in a better place. Um, you know, and then the other thing is, you know, no, no hard work goes by the wayside. That's something that my parents and my dad, especially, um, instilled in me just, you know, you might not get exactly what you want, but working hard is never a bad thing. Working hard is always a good thing. And there's always something positive that's going to come out of working your butt off. So make sure you do that. Um, you know, so just really encouraging parents who were, you know, tough on me, but also were super encouraging. And, you know, like I said, we talked about it before, but my dad, ultimate confidence, no matter why he didn't, he didn't care who we wrestle and he believed that his boys were going to find a way to win. Um, you know, and you can say it's blind, blind confidence, right? Um, sometimes when, when we were outmatched, but he just never believed that we weren't, uh, you know, tough enough or skilled enough or, you know, we, we weren't going to find a way to get the dub. And that was, uh, you know, very, very important for us. And I take that into my coaching career as well. You know, I believe in so many guys, you know, especially, you know, the big guys come come to play, but Nation, Kyle, uh, you know, Vito, Yanni, like every time I step on the mat, I I truly believe they're going to find a way to win. And it doesn't matter how bad of a situation they get into. I just truly believe they're going to find a way to get the job done. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful to my dad for that, for just teaching me what, uh, you know, blind confidence, so to speak, is. And was it your dad or was it you who came up with the idea to be the first four-time state champ in Jersey? No, nah, so uh, it was the both of us. Um, you know, my dad, like I said, he, he didn't, uh, he wrestled a couple of years in high school, but obviously he, he liked the sport. And then, um, you know, before I was born, he would always go to the state championships and, and watch. And then, uh, you know, when, when I started to get older, we, we'd always go to the state tournament when I was, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, um, you know, we'd go to the state tournament every year, but we were really thinking about and brainstorming, you know, some, some really good goals. And he's like, you know, I, I think you can be a four timer, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, at the time we didn't know what would go into it, but it, it was that blind belief again. You know what I mean? Uh, that blind belief that, you know, I know that you'll, you're going to work hard. I know that, right. You know, he, he knew that, that, that we, we'd, we'd work hard and, and find the coaching and, and figure, figure that stuff out. But, you know, you're going to set yourself up for an opportunity to win four. Um, you know, you just got to continue to, you know, trust the process in the sense of, continuing to work and find the best coaching for you and just kind of do the best we could for what we had and, and just work, you know, the, the, the working hard will win the day. That was kind of the, the belief, you know, um, you know, if, if, even if you weren't in the best training situation, you know, by working your butt off and just, just outworking everybody, right. Put yeah. more hours in every day, you're going to find a way to get yourself in the right situation. And then, you know, with the success that comes and, and the more experience that comes, you'll figure out who the better coaches are and we'll find a way to get you there. You know, and there's the big thing of just my parents found a way for everything, you know, obviously on the other side of it. Now I can imagine how expensive it was. So I thank them, you know, every day for sacrificing the way they did, you know, for myself, but also for Marky, my little brother, and uh, for my older brother as well. Um, but yeah, it was just like, we're going to find a way, you know, the, the, the mental toughness and, and just the tenacity was there. It was just finding a way to at, attain the best skills to make you, uh, you know, the the guy that could be able to win the, the four state titles. So, so so how old do you think you were when you and your dad were having those brainstorming conversations at the state tournament? Uh, I mean, I was, yeah, probably like, I, I was probably, I don't know, fourth grade. So what is that, like 10 or so? Yeah. So yeah, you guys are... I'd say, I'd say... 
So yeah. it had to be pretty yeah, special, the fact that you guys were sitting there and you had those memories, you and your dad going together, and you know you're you're getting yeah. involved with the sport, but you know, probably haven't you know achieved any. Maybe you've achieved some level of success in fourth grade, but nothing to the degree that would point your dad to saying he would be a four timer. But he just had that belief, and you guys had kind of that bonded from yeah. there. The rest, the rest is well, history. Yeah, 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 and and I mean, I don't know, I don't know if there's any states that haven't had four timers yet. Um, but when you when you're in a state that there was no four timer, it's just like the the holy grail, you know what I mean? In the sense that like people are always talking about it, like you know who who can win four, like stuff like that, you know what I mean? Um, and so it was always just kind of on people's mind. And when you're so young, you don't have any perspective, right? So when you're at that age, it's like the high school guys are like the Olympic level guys for us now. Right? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so it's just like you put those guys on a pedestal and there's like, Oh, you know, I, maybe something I can win for, you know, and then, and then it's working, working your butt off trying to, trying to attain that. But I can remember, you know, when we were having those talks, watching Damien, you know, maybe that was a big part of it because Damien, uh, Han won, won three and, uh, you know, he probably should have won four. He had the guy up on his on his shoulder with short time left, and I think he put him down. And the guy in the screen or something. But realistically, you know, he probably should have won four, and um, you know, wrestled the the big weight classes, which I which I obviously didn't. So <laughs> uh, right, but but there's just such a mystique to it, especially in a state where there hadn't hadn't been done before. So it was it was definitely on the minds. It wasn't like it was it was a crazy aspiration to think that you could do it, I guess, but it wasn't crazy in the sense of, uh, you know, t- it, talking about it and being out there in the open because, you know, that was the goal everybody was kind of chasing for, you know, and a lot of people were just saying it though, right, and didn't believe it, but me and my dad believed it, um, and were willing to, you know, do whatever it took to get the job done um, with training with. Uh, you know, travel, whatever, 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 whatever it took, whenever it took. And I think there's 20 weeks in a row where we were in a hotel at a tournament. Um, you know, I, I, my mom uses that stat a good bit sometimes. Um, <laughs> so we were, we were, we were just, we were just very committed, um, very, very committed. And it was great too, because, you know, looking back on my childhood, those are the best memories that I can remember, uh, you know, loading up, you know, my older brother, John, myself, my, my little brother, Marky, and my mom and my dad, you know, we had, we had a minivan. We took the two, uh, ca- captain seats out. So we just had the back bench and then we had air mattress and we had, uh, um, Nintendo 64 and, and, uh, one of those small TVs and my dad got a, uh, an adapter. So you could plug it into the, uh, cigarette lighter and he had a bunch of fuses. So when they popped, we just pop a new one. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we play NFL blitz, we play NFL blitz, uh, you know, we, we played Golden Eye. Golden Eye was, you know, things would get heated in the van, and we just travel all over. You know, we we travel all over the, you know, the Northeast and Pennsylvania, Ohio. So I guess into the Midwest a bit. Um, you know, and we, we just travel all over, and we didn't think anything of it as kids. It was just we loved wrestling, and you know, it just became a norm, and we were always together as a family. So, you know, it was the best of both worlds, and I think that's why my mom. And my dad loved it so much as we didn't realize that we were getting such family, such great family time every weekend, you know, and then even during the week going to practice. Um, so it was, it was cool. It started off as, you know, a thing with me and my dad. And then, um, you know, as we started to jump level, it turned into a big family thing, which is even better looking back. Well, I can remember as a kid, you know, my family would do kind of that circuit as well, but only within Illinois. So like every weekend we were gone, yep. but like on Monday at school, I kind of felt lonely because all weekend you're around your family. My grandparents would come, yeah. you know, and then you get back to school and you kind of just got to, you're on your own. But you're know, looking back to your point, those yeah. were just amazing times having everyone together like that. And so you guys did that yeah. to the extreme. And then going, yeah. into your, going into your freshman year, you won Fargo. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so I won Fargo, uh, I think it was like 98 cat. So that was, it was good. It, it kind of, you know, set me up, put me in a good spot going into the, you know, my first season in high school. And then, you know, you won your first three, obviously your first three state titles. Mm-hmm. And then your senior year, I got to imagine the media around it was, I know there wasn't social media around, but there had to be some press and attention around it. 
Like, was there ever the point where you kind of felt overwhelmed by it or had any self doubts about it going into your senior year? I think I just like going in like so the the week before the season or whatever. I wrestled the East South Park Open, um, and I took third in that, so that didn't help things either. You know, getting getting the the media storming before my senior year, um, and then I went to uh, went to BC East, and I ended up losing to some kid from Pennsylvania. You know, it was a really bad loss to be honest. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think, I, I think I might have placed in the States a couple of times, never won a state title. Uh, you know, I just wrestled really poorly. I put a little too much stress on myself. Um, you know, I was warming up for like hours before my matches. Just <laughs> wouldn't stop moving. Yeah, it was just, it was, it, you know, it wasn't great. So then I lost. And then from there, I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to succeed if I don't just, you know, cool my jets and wrestle. So I found my groove and, um, you know, started wrestling well again. But yeah, it was, uh, it was it was challenging because you know I wrestled in the college tournament did well and then you know transitioned into high school and a lot of times that happens right where you're you put too much pressure on yourself because you're like, okay I, I did well at this college tournament so now I should go out there and roll with these high school kids mm-hmm. and uh, you know it didn't happen <laughs> so, <laughs> it didn't happen and you know and and I always tell our guys you know you, you know that they're allowed to wrestle you back right <laughs> <laughs> so like relax like like you wanna you're, you're, you're too busy trying to, to pin the guy, just wrestle, right? You, you know, a lot of times you're, you're right. Or if you're wrestling, you need a major for your team, right. To, to win the duel. The first thing I tell my guys is don't change the way you wrestle. Just wrestle. Let the points come, right. Let, let everything happen organically. And then you, you'll find yourself in a position to pin the guy. But if you go out there and just try to underhook him and get to the body constantly and you never wrestle there, you're only hurting yourself, right? Like wrestle in positions that you, can wrestle from and can score from and that you, you know, that you pin guys from. If I, if I asked you, how would you pin somebody, you know, in the, in the practice room, what's your best chance of pinning somebody? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, a cradle, head and arm, whatever it is. You probably want to try to do that on a mat. You don't want to do something that you never do just because you need a pin. You know what I mean? So that type of, um, you know, that type of thing was, was big. So. And was there ever yeah, any, so, uh, ever any, um, not concerned, but ever any, Separation between like your your parents being like coach versus parents, or was it always kind of that joint role for them? Because I ask a lot of a lot of guys who are super high performers that question. Yeah. It's always interesting to hear that that answer. Yeah, I coach, my dad wasn't my coach after my eighth grade year. Okay, you know what I mean. So like, he, and, I mean, that wasn't like he he sat in my corner all the, all the tournaments and stuff. You know what I mean? And you know he was like your typical parent, uh, I guess like parent coach. You know what I mean? that you see it most of the times. Um, but you know a good bit from just being around it, you know what I mean? Um, being around the practices and stuff. But once I got to high school, it was just my high school coaches and my club coaches. And, you know, obviously he got on me. If I didn't have a good day, let me know for sure. Um, <laughs> but but for the most part, it was just like, all right, go to practice. And, um, yeah, and then once I got my license, he didn't, he didn't really go to much practices. So he was just like, all right. You know, at this point, this is you. Um, you know, but like, like I said, he wouldn't—he wouldn't be thrilled if I wasn't winning. That's just, you know, he, if if I wasn't if I wasn't wrestling, um, you know, up, up to my potential, he'd let me know, right? And he wouldn't necessarily be upset about the result. It's just like, hey, the, that that wasn't a good effort. So, but that rarely happened. You know what I mean? I was always pretty dialed in when I stepped on the mat. For the for the most part, I was trying to kill a guy so <laughs> <laughs> yeah that... you know what I mean like I, I, I and I never I never lacked intensity I guess you could say right and anytime I stepped on the mat I never lost because I never lost for lack of intensity you know what I mean absolutely so. man and how did you end up in uh, in Cornell I'm sure you were recruited by a lot of the top schools in the east coast if not nationally yeah no yeah so uh you know I looked at a lot of schools um you know uh Michigan Lehigh UPenn Northwestern um you know, and uh, I talked with Rob and uh, um, Steve Garland, and then Corey Cooperman got a job here as a first year coach um, when he graduated. And Corey coached me in Fargo a bunch, um, you know, for Team New Jersey. And I'd just been around him. I trained up with Blair a good bit, and he was there as well, um, you know, just 
getting workouts in and stuff. So I had a pretty good, pretty good relationship with Corey. Um, so it made, it made sense. I, I was, I was cool with him. Um, you know, Rob obviously, um, does a great job and, and, and that was great. And then Garland at the time was the, was the coach, was the assistant and he's a, you know, national, national finalist, uh, or I, I don't know. I think, I think he might've been national champ. I know he was in the finals. Um, and it was, you know, a great situation. And then obviously Garland got the head job at Virginia that year, but it was still a good situation for me. So Cornell fit the bill, so to speak. Man, Garland's energy is infectious, man. I've had him on before. He's oh a, yeah. He's an exciting guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a fiery guy. You know what I mean? He's <laughs> he's he's uh yeah. I mean, he's got a ton of energy. That's that's the best way to put it. You know, that's really the only way to put it. He's he is energetic boy. <clears throat> he's like a Tasmanian devil. Right? <laughs> with, 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 without the destruction, obviously, but no, he's just got a ton of energy. He's fun to be around. Uh, you know, and that dude's a worker, which is always great. You know, it's, it's always, it's always great to be around guys that work their butts off because it uh, gives you, you know, somebody to look up to and somebody to, you know, aspire to be like and work hard like. So, well, man, you, you had an unbelievable career there. Two-time All-American, one of the top win leaders all time. And then once you were done, I mean, did you kind of always know you wanted to go into coaching, or were you thinking about going out into the real world a little bit? Uh, no, I always wanted to coach. I mean, I started helping out. Um, so when I was in high school, Mark was, you know, Mark's six years younger than me. So he was in like middle school or whatever. Uh, I would take him to practice. So, um, we, we both went to the edge, edge school wrestling. So I would, uh, you know, in, in the off season or yeah, yeah. Usually in the off season outside of like the high school traditional season, I'd come home from school, uh, pick him up, and then I'd take him up to practice. He'd have practice from like, you know, six to seven thirty or something. Then I'd go eight to nine thirty. So I would just walk around and help because you know I'd do some homework and then I'd, I had nothing but time to kill. So I, was, I didn't want to just sit on the wall, and hang out. So I'd walk around and you know instruct the kids. It wasn't like they were learning crazy stuff that I was trying to learn myself. Um, you know, it was pretty basic stuff. So. I'd walk around and help the kids and that kind of got it going for me. And then when I was in college, I went to uh, a Fargo and I always coached team New Jersey. Um, and I really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed being around the kids. Um, you know, and it, it keeps you young. Even, even when I was in high school, even when I was in college, right. It kept me young. And then now it's, it's something I really enjoy doing. You know, I coached team New Jersey all the way, all the way up until last summer when my uh, little one was born. You know, that was the first, first time I missed in like 14 years. Coaching wow. to New Jersey, so yeah, so or actually it was probably twelve years then because, uh, yeah, this would be fourteen. So yeah, but anyways, I coached New Jersey a ton, and um, you know, really just enjoyed, enjoyed, uh, you know, building people up. I think wrestling and 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 all that good stuff. I've been lucky enough to be around some. I've been lucky enough to have been around some uh, some wonderful coaches from you know the time I was young, and my dad was working his butt off trying to find the best coaching for me all the way up until, you know, now being around Kyle and heck even being around the guy like Yanni, just learn something new every day. Um, you know, so been around some great, great technicians, guys that do well. So that, that voted well for me and made it easy, but then also just trying to motivate guys and, and just believe in them kind of like my dad and my parents did me is something that is, you know, it's, it's so big and it's, uh, you know, priceless. Yeah. Believing in somebody and, and, uh, you know, I know as an athlete, when I was an athlete, when my, I knew my coaches had utmost, you know, belief and trust in me. And that's, that's what I want to get back to my athletes and my student athletes, just let them know that, you know, I believe that they've been trained the right way. I believe that in their hard work. Um, and I know that they're going to do everything they can. And that's all you can really ask, ask for as a coach. Um, you know, I get real, I get real pissed, honest to be honest. When when uh, you know when a coach is gets in the guy real bad, obviously there's corrections everybody needs to make on a mat, and I, I understand that. But it nobody goes out there and is like, I want to lose. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, especially at Division One level. Like, I mean, I think anywhere, honestly, I, I find it hard to believe that somebody's going to go on the mat and purposely wants to lose before they even go out there. Um, so the point being is that they're not trying to lose, so you don't need to tear them up and down. Right. Obviously, you need to let them know 
there's things I did right, there's things I did wrong, and, and you can be stern about the things I did wrong. And, 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 if, and if you went over it all week long and they still made a mistake, yeah, I get it. You're agitated. But for, trying, for attacking somebody for not putting, uh, you know, for essentially an wanting to lose on purpose. Or, yeah, an outcome and, you know, and for their level of uh, effort and commitment. Eh, that's not that's not my brand of coaching, I guess, you know. I, I, I and maybe it's just and I don't I don't think this is the case, but you know, our guys are really motivated, which is which is really great to be around. Um so maybe my guys are always just giving maximum effort, but you know, I don't need to get on my guys, I guess, is the moral here. Yeah. Uh get on my guys for their effort. They're always they're always giving their maximum effort. They want to do great and then a lot of times it comes down to we gotta change some technique around or we got to fix this and, you know, we got to fix your, you know, your match preparation mentally, things along those lines. But, you know, the effort is there. And that's the one thing as a coach that I'm always looking for. And I'm always proud of um, when my guys go out there and put it on the line. That's, that's all I can ask for. And if they come off the mat and they wrestle their butts off and they, they had maximum effort, then everything else we can fix. So Kind of speaks to that philosophy that John Wooden always had <clears throat> where, you know, he said his, definition of success was having peace of mind and that's from total effort yeah. in preparation and yeah. not the outcome at all. Like he, he wouldn't even watch. I mean, of yeah. course he did watch him, but he goes, we've done everything we can in practice. I don't even need to coach this game. Whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. So it seems like that kind of philosophy permeates the Cornell program. Yeah, no, I mean, Rob's that way, um, you know, in the sense of like, I mean, obviously there's, you know, some hopefully in wrestling, especially you can do some mid match adjustments. You know what I mean? The guy goes out of bounds, like, Hey, you know, fix his hand or, you know, do a better job with your head. But for the most part, yeah. Like the preparation is done. Like, you know, everything is, is, is done. Like you're, you can pretty much just sit there. <laughs> right. <So laughs> I, I, agree, I agree with that. And I think that's the way our program is. Right. We, we put a lot of trust in our guys. Um, like for instance, before our wins or, you know, um, the day before we used to do a 30 minute drill in a match, but whereas I, I see a lot of other programs put their guys, um, through everything. So every, every single thing they do workout wise, like, all right, you know, they put them through the workout. Um, so I don't know if that's a trust thing or if they just, you know, or want to make sure that it's done right. But for us, we trust our guys to know what they need to get done and, and, they, and they get it done. You know, um, do we give them suggestions about a great warm up? Absolutely. Um, if they ask us, Hey, put me through a warm up, Absolutely. But we're not going to have a, a team. We, we, we don't have a team, you know, warm up. So yeah. yeah, I guess the moral being is that we, we put a lot of, uh, trust in our guys. Um, and that gives them ownership of themselves, of their wrestling, of their program, right. Of their university. It all leads to that sense of pride, um, which leads them to be proud alumnus that like to come back and, and, and support the program, but also it gives them ownership then and there and um it helps them mature right i can't tell you i can't hold your hand forever um you know and that's kind of the the thinking behind that and our guys really respond to that and and they've done a great job with that so well the one thing i always find refreshing about the cornell program and we'll wind down in just a just a bit here but one of my favorite parts about talking talking with the cornell guys is you guys are the epitome of the work smart mentality in the sense that you're not making your guys get up at five to do stadium sprints. You know, you put a focus on sleep and you put a focus on just kind of making the experience as enjoyable as possible. And what I mean is, you know, coach Cornell talk, coach Colt Cornell, coach Cole talks about going down to Florida just to get out of the gloom and doom for a little bit, you know? And so all these things go into it. Like talk about, you know, kind of the, the routine of a Cornell guy. So if a high school guy's listening to this, like what would their week be like? And, you know, how do you guys kind of yeah. emphasize sleep versus that work hard grind mentality? Yeah. I mean, so here's the thing, like we work smart, but when we work, we're, everybody works the same. You know what I mean? Like we're working just as hard as Iowa or whatever. You know what I mean? Like we're in here, we're getting after it. Um, you know, so we just, so essentially what it comes down to is us as, you know, myself, Rob, Kyle, and, and, uh, Gabe, we just make ourselves, you know, more uh, accessible in the sense of, Instead of get, bringing the whole team in at 6 a.m., I'll do, you know, six, sometimes, you know, at, at, at the most, six individual workouts in a day with the guys. You know what I mean? So we'll work on skills or we'll do conditioning or we'll work on, you know, film prep, whatever it is. Like, the guys will get a workout in, but it'll just be a, a, a better time for them. So, 
you know, on Monday, our guys drift lift so that they get a lift in um, over at, at our varsity weight room any time before noon. And we do that because we come back at 4.30 for practice. We want to make sure that they've had uh, ample amount of rest before they practice. So our guys, but we could do that at 6 a.m., right? We could do that at 6 a.m. for sure. Um, but once again, it goes back to what I spoke of before. We give our guys freedoms because we believe that they're um, mature enough and responsible enough and they care enough to get everything done, right? So they're going to they're gonna go ahead and, and, and find a way to manage their time and get to class and also – get this lift in and then be ready for practice. Right. So we, we put a lot of, uh, we put a lot on our guys in, in regards to trust and time management and just maturity. Um, but yeah, so Monday's lift drill Tuesday will, uh, like Tuesday, you know, I have guys come in from usually anywhere from 8 AM to through 11 sometimes just working on individual skills, some conditioning, um, you know, whatever they need. And then we have practice in the afternoon on Wednesday. We do Wednesday is our uh, lighter day because Monday and Tuesday at team practice, we really get after it. We do high volume live wrestling, uh, whether it be long goes or short goes hard drilling. Uh, we just really get after it. So on Wednesday we have a team lift at three forty-five, and then we do uh, you know, a 30 minute spar. Um, then that's on their own in the sense that we just kind of let them work out their, their, their soreness and, and move, um, you know, with with a 30 minute drill Thursday, we do a lot of sparring and work on positions in the afternoon. And then on Friday, if we're competing, we leave. And if we're not, we, we wrestle matches in the afternoon. So every single morning, depending upon our wrestler schedule, we're putting them through conditioning workouts, extra conditioning. We're putting them through, um, you know, some guys get extra lifts in, we're putting them through, uh, um, you know, technique workouts and, and, uh, technical, technical things. So it's really whatever they need in the morning, but it's on their time. It's on, so it allows them to sleep and study, um, you know, and, and to be the most effective and, you know, the most prepared version of themselves, as opposed to get them up every morning and just force them to do it and, you know, have them miss class and, and uh, not be a hundred percent and not, you know, not really enjoy it. So, you know, our, our guys, you know, work really hard, but they enjoy the process. They enjoy being around their teammates. They enjoy, um, you know, they enjoy our culture. And we, I think we really get the most out of them. We, we really, um, you know, try to try to suck up all the, every bit of ability I think we get out of our guys for the most part. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident in that. So that's kind of like our, our, our week. We have our, our team stuff in the afternoon and the morning is all, um, individual base, whether it be groups of one and me and me and another uh, student athlete, or it be you know four guys coming in at once and me put them through positions or whatever it might be. So, and then also right now, at least for this year, you throw in the the freestyle wrinkle as well. Um, you know, running freestyle practices for Yanni, Vito, Nation, um, you know, and, and Max and all the freestyle guys. You know, uh, piece in RTC workouts as well. So. Uh, you know, we're definitely wearing a lot of hats, but, Dude. but we enjoy it. <laughs> it's kind of crazy that you know, college we, coaches are now tied to the performance of their Olympic guys. And I guess they kind of always have been, but it seems like now, especially it's like, like when Snyder yeah, left Ohio state, Tom Ryan had to answer for it. Whereas like, it just seems like a lot, you know, um, it, yeah, good no, and bad. Yeah. So for sure. Yeah. So we, we have coach a hot, uh, um, so he's, he's our RTC coach as well. So he does, uh, trains trained both freestyle and Greco guys. Um, but I like to, you know, be in there with, and, and I, I mean, I, I run a lot of the, the freestyle workouts um, a lot, a lot because like Nation, Vito, Yanni, those are, you know, guys I work with. So it just happens to, to be there. You know what I mean? But then guys like Max Dean and Scotty Boykin and stuff, um, you know, they're like, Hey, you're running a workout. I'd love to get in on that. You know? So, so we just made it a, you know, an, I guess a, an RTC slash red shirt practice thing. So, but yeah, lots of workouts, you know, every day, um, you know, it just keeps us busy. So, but that, that's, it goes back to that work ethic, right. And, and that's our job, right. I, I get paid to, you know, help these kids. So I, I need to do that. Um, and, you know, and, and it can't be, I can't be selfish in the regards that, um, you know, I, 6 a.m. that's all we got. That, that's just the way it is. Right. Um, I think adapt and overcome, is kind of a, 
a, a great motto that you could use for us in the sense that, um, you know, the 6 a.m. days are, I think they're dying. I really do. I think that um, more and more programs are customizing their, their, their practice schedules, uh, you know, in like on the, on the skill side, you know, in the conditioning side and things like that. I think everybody has team practices, but I think that more and more programs are starting to, bring their guys in individually and work on skills and get them whatever they need and just give them, give the guys more individualized attention um, in the sense of trying to build them, you know, in whatever way they need to be. And, um, you know, you're seeing some more success out of different programs because of it, I believe. Yeah. And I, I just love the focus on sleep. I feel like that was kind of a dying yeah, thing yeah, where yeah. like getting up early yeah. and four hours of sleep, even yeah, in the so, business world, yeah, I noticed crazy. a big change, man. Like, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your brother's a you know high-profile attorney, and I'm sure you know a lot of guys that work on Wall Street. But like back in the day, 80s and 90s, it was like a badge of honor not to sleep. And now I feel like, and I am hopeful that there's a change um, across wrestling, but even just in general. Like it seems like there's a much bigger emphasis on sleep, and you guys really get that. Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, we had a a, um, a Psych 101 professor, Professor Moss. Uh, or Mo- uh, Moffin, yeah, Professor Moffin. So I actually took the class, um, and it's really, it, it's a psych, it's a psych class, but it really focuses on sleep a ton. Um, and he's kind of like the, the groundbreaking professor on, on sleep. So he's not, I think he re- he retired uh, several years ago, but he was kind of like the, the torchbearer, we'll say, for for sleep studies and, mm-hmm. and stuff along those lines, and, and the benefits of sleep. And he was like, he, he met with Rob. I think this is probably 15 years, maybe 18 years ago now. I was like, listen, you think that, you know, it's what you got to do to get more work done, but you're better off doing, le- like, you'd be better off just doing less work and letting these kids sleep and you'll, you'll, you get high performance, I guarantee it. And obviously we didn't do less work. We just found a way to get all the work in with just adding sleep. Because realistically, like, and I'm sure it's like at this way at a lot of, like, you know, institutions where, um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of rigor, you know, and it's rigorous behind the, the academic side of it. Um, but our guys are, and on average, I would say probably getting to sleep at like midnight. For sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which probably is pretty late, midnight, you midnight. know? It, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But for, you know, for college, it's pretty early, which is nice. Um, you know, obviously, some guys are, you know, more and some guys are less, you know, like Yanni sleeps like a, like a champ. That dude's always sleeping. Um, <laughs> but, <clears throat> right? Some guys like just need more sleep, but the thing is, is that if you look at it right, if you're going to get up at six a.m., you're probably up at five trying to get some food in you, right? And then, or you're at least up at five fifteen, and you go to, and you 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 get to bed by midnight, so you probably fall asleep by like twelve fifteen or twelve thirty. That's no sleep. That's brutal. And if you do that for an extended period of time, you're going to fall apart, right? Um, so we just didn't see the benefit, and we saw a lot of benefit um, behind. What, what the professor was telling us and you know it's it's made it i think rob made the change i don't know probably like anywhere from 17 to 20 years two years ago cut out the morning workouts you know and i mean don't get me wrong like when, when we're like in the past when we send guys home for thanksgiving like we'll do a 7 a.m workout <laughs> you know what i mean like it's not like we never go early because it just makes it makes sense in our schedule like We'll, we'll go early like a couple of times, like before uh, we send the guys home for Christmas, we'll do an early workout so they can get on the road, mm-hmm. you know, but we don't do six a.m. or early workouts. You yeah, know, we probably do four in a year <laughs> as opposed to five a week. Which like you just layer on yeah, the yeah. fact that these guys are already cutting weight. They're doing, uh, you know, a lot of intense schoolwork, especially at Cornell. Um, and then you factor on the fact that I heard someone's not even someone, but um, a, a neuro expert in terms of sleep on the Joe Rogan podcast say that if you go with six hours of sleep or less for five days in a row, you're legally drunk, <laughs> which is uh, yeah. kind of crazy to think about, but it's like, shit, man, to your point, I, as an adult, I figure most people get to bed by 10, but college kids are probably getting to bed way later than that. And so you factor in those morning workouts. It's just really refreshing that yeah. you guys are kind of on the cutting edge of that kind of stuff. And the results certainly show. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're just, uh, I mean, we're just trying to figure out the best way to do it and, and get the most out of our guys, right? That's that's the, the goal for everybody. How can we maximize our performance? Yep. All right, and that's that's the name of the game. How can you get the most out of your guys while they can still have a great experience? Um, you know, and then 
we've done some tinkering, but that's, that's our goal is just trying to get the most out of our guys, make sure they enjoy their experience, um, you know, and, and just be proud and thankful and, and, you know, want to continue to be part of the program when they, when they leave, when they, when they graduate, that's, that's our goal as a coach, um, you know, and, and if, you, if you do that, then you're going to have national champs, all Americans, you know, world champions like Kyle, um, you know, you're going to have all the successes, but I mean, obviously Rod's been there for 31 years, so it takes time, um, you know, and then, and I've been lucky enough to been here to, to, you know, be at Cornell here for 14 years rather. Um, and I've been part of, so the the year before I came in 2015, I mean, 2015, 2005, sorry, is when Cornell took fourth with Travis Lee mm-hmm. and that whole crew. Um, and then I came, I got, came in 2006 is when I got to Cornell. So they had a lot of success, but then we, we had to keep building. Right. So I, I, I was in the trenches during the building days, you know, which is, which is a great time to be here. Um, it was, it was really neat to see the, the transfer, transformation over over the years. So, well, and now you guys it's, have had uh, someone in the NCAA finals. Like, I, I've everyone's heard the stat, but it's like ten years in a row or something crazy like that. So, did that did that start when you were on the team or after the fact? As a uh, that started when I was on the team. Yeah. Um, so probably started with Kyle. I think. Yeah. So you got four with Kyle, and then you got uh, Simez, Bozak, Nation. Um, Game. You know, it just kept going from there. Yep, Gabe, uh, Yanni. Um, oh, Mac Lewis was in there too. You know, he was a finalist. So man, yeah. But looking at it, that makes sense. Troy, that started the streak too. So yeah, Troy, uh, Jordan Lean, right? Jordan Lean was a finalist. He oh, kept yeah. the, he kept the streak alive. Yeah, when I was in school. And then so, Travis yeah, I mean, Lee started it, I think, or maybe there was that gap in between. But it's yeah. just unbelievable to think about those names that you're rattling off. Cam Simas, forgot about that dude. He's he was a beast. Yeah, yeah, Cam is awesome. He's he's out at uh, South Coast State now, so he's he's doing well. But yeah, well, cool man. Some, it's, good, some good guys. Oh, the the best dude. And honestly, you look at yeah. where Coach Cole learned all of his, not all of it, but a lot of his. Um, philosophy from Bill Lamb, another great guy. So I mean, the the, the yeah. roots run deep at Cornell, man. And you know, I'm ex- like you know, Rob has a, he has his own coaching tree now, which is pretty cool. You know, who who all does he have out there? So guys that are head coaches now, he has Nickerson, uh, Garland. He has uh, Brian Smith from Missouri. He he coached under Rob. Um, he had. Uh, Derek Del Porto, who's at Eastern Michigan. Uh, Damian Hahn. Um, be- yep, you got Damian. He has uh, who else? Oh, Jeremy Spates, Matt Azevedo. Wow, so he's got a lot. That might be the yeah, then, uh, the most. I mean, yeah, I don't I mean, know. That's a ton. <laughs> obviously, was a, yeah, he has a ton of head coaches. Um, and then obviously you got you know Jordan Lean at Pitt doing a good job. A ton of assistant coaches as well. So it's. Um, that's pretty cool. Wait, is Jordan yeah. Lee not at the UFC Institute anymore? Or am I thinking of uh, someone Clint else? Clint Wattenberg. Clint Wattenberg, yeah, Clint, that's right. Clint Watt- yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so Clint's still there, and Clint's doing some fantastic stuff. Um, but yeah, so, so he's, you know, and that just goes to show, you know, um, you know, I'm sitting in our student lounge right now, and we got all the All-American frames up there, and it's kind of cool to see, you know, the, the Cornell guys have gone on the coaching, but also, you know, a guy like Clint Wattenberg who's, you know, at the Performance Institute and in, in uh, UFC Performance Institute in uh, Las Vegas, doing some great stuff with with the fighters there. So it's uh, it's been fun. It, it, it is fun for sure. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, been, absolutely, yeah, man. It, it's a great place to be. It's it's been an honor to talk with you. And I, you know, I always tell people the first, really, the first flow video that really pulled me in was when you guys were touring the Freedman Center. And I think we'll just sign off with, um, you know, what are you guys doing now with with the updates to the Freedman Center? Yeah, so it's really, really cool. So we're almost going to double the, the square footage of our Freeman Center. Um, so we're putting in um, a much bigger training room with, um, you know, walk-in cold and hot tubs, um, like I'm sure you can imagine. Um, our locker room is going to be huge, so we're putting a much bigger locker room in. We're doing a Hall of Fame area, so the weight room right now is in the front of the building when you walk in. We're putting the weight room on the back of the building now, and we're going to have a big uh, – you know, foyer and Hall of Fame area as soon as you walk in. And we're going to have an RTC 
uh, about a mat, mat and a half, an RTC wrestling room. That's a, a wide open concept, uh, and it's going to tie into our weight room that's going to move to the back of the building. So it'll be a wrestling room, and then right next to the wrestling room will be, uh, you know, weights and all that good stuff, uh, racks, um, uh, cardio equipment, rather, sorry. And then we're going to have a, it's a huge student lounge with a, a kitchenette and then, um, you know, TVs that span the, the length of the entire wall, uh, video games. And then um, so there's a where our student lounge is now. We're going to make it a, a, a sleep pod area. I, I, I push for bunk beds because uh, bunk beds are awesome. But <laughs> <laughs> Rob, Rob, Rob went with uh, sleep pods. So we're going to put sleep pods in here and make this, you know, you talk about sleep, how important it is for us, right? So he's going to make it a pretty much a sleeping room um, where our, uh, I guess, student lounge is now as is. So we're keeping this and we're also putting, a, a you know, another big, student lounge in, in the addition. So um, the addition is going to be great. We're going to get, you know, more mat space for the RTC, which is great. And we can do workouts at the same time. So why are you um, doing that? You know, every, why, every is that a legal that we... thing to have separate rooms or what's the thought process behind that? Maybe other people are doing that as just, well, but. Oh, just, just more mat space. Yeah. You know? Like we want to add, we want to add. So it'll be, it's going to be on the addition side. So uh, we, we, we love the way our, our mats are now. Our square footage is with our, we, we, have, we have about, when you look at it, we have about four mats right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, actually, I mean, I, I, if, if traditional size mats, I'd say four and a half because we have one monstrous mat in the middle, then we have two normal size mats, and then we have, uh, you know, runner mats on, on the side there sure. and all that good stuff. So, so when we have tons of, tons of wrestling room, but it would just be great to be able to, um, you know, we don't have RTC every day. Um, so we, we like to have, like we have our, we have, we have practice every day, but we want to be able to have RTC and Cornell practice go at the same time, but in different locations there. So, um, you know, RTC doesn't have to go late or doesn't have to go earlier than they want to go. We want to make it to where everybody has prime time, can work out whenever they want. So it, it's the perfect, uh, you know, perfect time to do that. And also, it's always great to have more wrestling space. Yeah. Right. It, it's never it's never a bad thing to have more more mats and more wrestling space. So. Um, that I was kind of thinking for that is that we can just always have, you know, freestyle workouts all year round, anytime you want in the back room, right? Because you can't have free, you can't have RTC workouts when you're, when it's freestyle, right? Right. Um, when I just, I, mean, I don't want people around, to, the other way around, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah at yeah. the college time. No, the other way around. Yeah. You, you, you can't, you can't wrestle folk style in an RTC workout. So, <clears throat> but if we have two rooms, it, it's perfect. Well, I just don't want people to forget, Coach Gray, that the Freedman Center was the OG of the wrestling complexes. Oh, yes. yes. No, we are – we were the first, right? So the Cornell – well, the Cornell Wrestling, but also the Freedman Wrestling Center made it viable for universities to put money in wrestling, right? Before that, everybody's weight room – I mean, everybody's wrestling room, rather, was a dungeon, a couple windows, and that was it, right? And then Rob, you know, this is his brainchild, right? He – Raised the money and, and did it all. And the, the really interesting thing about the Freeman Center is that it was it's all raised off of alumni dollars. I mean, it's all built off of alumni dollars. So the original and the addition. Amazing. We don't have, you know, it's not, you know, massive football that you know or massive, uh, you know, TV contract that's that's flipping the bill for this building. It's all of our com- Cornell alums, right? And that's why it's important and we, and, but more importantly, we take pride in making sure that our guys work hard and have a great experience because then they want to, they want somebody else to have the same experience they did. Right. Right. They, they want somebody to experience this, this, you know, great program the way they did. So they're willing to, you know, flip the bill and make sure, make sure that this wonderful new addition happens. So everybody can enjoy the program and, and, and can enjoy it and enjoy each other's company for you know years to come. It's an amazing thing, and if you would have told probably one of the uh, administrators when Coach Cole was hired in the early 90s, if Cornell would have the first standalone wrestling facility, they probably would have laughed in his face, and it just shows how uh, yeah. how incredible of a job he's done. You know, By far, yeah. one of the, the top coaches of our era, first ballot Hall of Famer. Oh, and yeah. He could coach a master class yeah. on networking, couldn't he? he could. Yeah, no, he could for sure. I think he could... He could uh definitely coach, uh, coach a class on, teach a class, class on that. But also I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, he's such a great fundraiser. He, he's written a book for fundraising and, uh, you know, college wrestling for sure. Um, you know, he, it, but it's realistically like other programs that do a good job fundraising 
for their RTC. You know, that that's wonderful. But Rob fundraises both budgets, Cornell Wrestling and the, our, our RTC. And it's know? not just it's one just, fat cat donor like some other programs. Uh, it's a ton of people. Uh, uh, yes. It's, he is unreal. He's, nobody can, you know, can shine his shoes when it comes to this. And I'm confident in that, you know. He's, right. He's the best in the game, and he could he could teach a master's class in fundraising for sure. Um, and the, the the best thing about it though is, and you know, the one thing that always tells us is like just develop relationship with these people. And it, it's not like you're pulling teeth, you know what I mean? Right. Like we think of it as like just twisting somebody's arm, but no, he for one he knows these people for thirty one years, right? But the other thing is he's hungry to develop new friendships. He's always looking, and that's just his personality, right? He's always hungry and looking to develop new relationships with people and not just to, to get money out of them, just to, you know, widen his network, goes back to his network, right? Like well, you were just talking about. Well, Andy, your point, I think you said before to me in the past that, you know, he's not just asking, asking, asking. He's giving a lot. Like he's doing speeches all the time, like things that oh, no one yeah. in wrestling knows about. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. He's always like, he'll go to the Rotary Club, like. You know, he'll do all these things, and we do a lot to get, you know, attendance for our matches outside of, you know, our, our, our you know, traditional Ithaca, you know, local fans. Like, when we have big-time matches, we, we work our butt off, and we throw a lot of darts at the board. We'll do community outreach. You know, Rob will go speak at the Rotary Club. We'll go speak at the, you know, um, uh, whatever it might be. Right. You know what I mean? Just Grassroots lo- stuff, lo- Local, yeah, lo- local programs. Um, you know, he'll, he'll go speak, at the, speak to them. Um, and we really just, you know, put a lot into making sure our guys have a great crowd every time they, you know, step on the mat. And what that does is that to, to be able to get that done, we have to do a lot in the community, which, you know, it's a full circle, which then leads to more fans knowing more about our program and knowing more of our, of our program. And then, you know, that building our attendance and it just goes and goes and goes in circles. Right. So it's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Right. In, in right. that regard, right? We just keep building fans by trying to get fans. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it, then you, 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 keep, you keep them coming in by just trying to, you know, let them take a look into your program. And it just keeps going in a circle. Well, I can tell you for sure that what came first is Coach Cole building those relationships before anything else came. It's not just oh, going to be, oh, you know, dialing up 100%. the alumni list and asking for money because every, every alumni gets that no matter where they went to school, but it's like, how many yes. times have I got a call from yeah. my school to say, Hey, do you want to come just hang out and watch a game tonight? Never. Right. But yeah. Yeah. No, and that's really it. You know, and that's the thing. Um, everybody gets a call from their, from their university, whether you're an athlete or not. You know, I still get calls. To, <laughs> I get calls from Cornell. I'm like, I gave the wrestling program. <laughs> I'm good. That, 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 that's my, that's my contribution for the year to the university. You know, they asked about, do you want to donate to the general fund? And it's really funny. My wife was, I had the head on speaker. So we do a phone a thon every year. Um, you know, I'm sure people may have seen some, some stuff on social media about it. Um, so we do a phone a thon. We call all of our alumni and, you know, get them to, to give. And they all know when it's coming and they enjoy it because they remember when they were on the call. So I got a call from the general fund from a kid that, uh, you know, w- was following the script. I, 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 I knew he was, he was reading off his script, his, his prompt paper, so I just threw him a couple curveballs to see what he'd say, and I was messing with him. It was pretty funny, but uh, but yeah. So it's uh, everybody gets calls from their university, right? It's it's how can you personalize it? How can you um, make everybody feel important in the sense, you know, and and have them understand that we're not just doing it just for the money. Like we actually want them to continue to to be an active member of our program. You know that that's that's the big thing. And then, and then if they haven't, you know, been been involved in the program in a while, come back. We're always, you know, c- come back to the program. You know, we we'd love to have you come to a match and and uh, you know give you a tour of the Freedman Center and just let let you see what you've been missing out on. You know, sometimes there's some folks that wrestled in the '80s or something or you know the '70s and um, you know haven't really thought much about it since. And like, hey, you know, we got a beautiful wrestling facility. Come back, come watch a match. We'll give you a tour of it. You know, we want you to come back to our family. They probably can't Something even like that, believe you know? the changes, man. That's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to it's hard to come across people like that at, at this point at Cornell now because, like, it's funny because 
a lot of the guys like Cornell wasn't the best and, and the guys from the, you know, the nineties and eighties, they'll tell you that, you know, they're like, yeah, we weren't great. Um, but it's funny when, the, when anytime they talked about it, like, yeah, I wrestled at Cornell. Oh, and, and they're just like, no, I wrestled in the nineties. It wasn't. What it was. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all like, yeah, we get, some of them are like, yeah, I don't even give them the caveat, whatever. Who cares? Let them, let them think I was great. Roll with it, baby. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but no, I think it's just important. You know, it all ties in, you know, building your fan, your alumni base and, and building your, your fans in general. Um, you know, you got to give them a good product. You got to have, you know, some, some, some wonderful kids that are going to work their butts off. Everybody is okay. Like, let me put it to you like this. When you watch a fight and you're rooting for somebody, but it was a good fight, like, you're not terribly upset, right? But when somebody's out there just getting killed and, and they're not, not fighting back, nobody wants to watch that, right? So as long as your athletes are out there working their butts off and, and uh, you know, fighting hard and, and trying to score and doing everything they can to win the match, the alumni is going to be supportive of that and, and, and see the effort and, and you can grow your, grow your following from there or grow your alumni base from there. And that's kind of that's where it started with Rob, right? The big match when Rob first got here was uh, Wilkes. Wilkes, Wilkes uh, University, I think. Wilkes, not, it's not college, yeah. So Wilkes University in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, right? Them and then Ithaca College. That was the biggest, <laughs> you know, matches. No way, And I remember dude. a couple of years ago, Rob was showing me some of the stuff he did early, early on to get people to come. He would, like, pledge push-ups, and he would come and do push-ups and, like, this, this crazy outlandish stuff just to, <laughs> to get people to come to the matches. You know what I mean? Uh, just, some, just some crazy stuff. Um, but... That goes to show you how committed he was to making, you know, this this situation the best situation and to get the program to where it is now and to be successful. Um, you know, hey, you gotta be a little crazy, and and he'll be the first one to tell you that. You gotta be obsessed with your, uh, you gotta be obsessed with success, right? And, and I think that's I think that's true in a lot of different fields, not 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 just coaching and wrestling, but you know, business world, a lot of things, right? You gotta be a bit a bit crazy about your craft. Are you, oh, it's definitely teetering on the edge of insanity most of the time if, with the real high performers. Yeah. And that's the people I'm obsessed yeah. with. Like the middle of the road people, yeah. God bless them. We got to have them in this country. But man, I like the people that are on the razor's edge at all times. Um, yeah. That's kind of who I like to gravitate yeah. towards. And speaking yeah. of that kind of person, this is the last question, I swear. I see okay. Joe DeSina <laughs> with the Spartan, you know, the Spartan, the CEO of the Spartan runs. Yes. He, what is the yeah. connection with him and Coach Cole? He's and Cornell the, guy. Is he? Dude, yes. I love the Spartan races. I've done um yes. done a couple of the ultras, a couple of the beasts. Um Yeah. Obsessed so he, with that uh, guy. Yeah, so his sons, um they're both from uh New Hampshire, I believe. Um but yeah, so so um so he is. So his boys his boys come to Cornell Wrestling Camp all the time. Um and it's so funny because for the intensive camp we have him we'll have him uh you know take the guys out for workouts sometimes <laughs> he's such a badass <laughs> and he does dude. all of his smart yeah he does all of his smart and stuff with them he has them carrying stand bags and all this good stuff but yeah so he his connection to cornell is that he is a cornelian you know and he's wow. a wrestling guy he loves wrestling he loves uh you know he's really close with rob um you know gabe is is doing some stuff with him now and he has a good relationship with rob um so yeah that, that that's that's the connection that's the smart connection with cornell wrestling so um, you know, Rob just finding people that are interested in in uh, our program. You know, just another example. He didn't wrestle. He didn't wrestle. It didn't didn't wrestle at Cornell. No, and it's no, funny. It's just Cornell. And, yeah. His podcast. If people haven't heard of it, when Joe Decina is a guest on the Tim Ferriss podcast, it's one of my all time favorites. Um, yeah, I mean, he's uh, he's just a worker. He's man. funny. Like, like he'll come to Ithaca and he'll bring a backpack and a kettlebell. <laughs> <laughs> How of a kettlebell is his carry on? <laughs> He's awesome, man. Well, yeah. Coach, like, what? It fits, fits, in, fits in the thing. So whatever. <laughs> in the, in the uh, uh, whatever that machine is that you put your stuff through. Yeah, the carry on. So, anyways, awesome dude. We we love him. He's a he's a crazy guy, but he's just he's just the right type of crazy for wrestling. Absolutely. So that's why he's, uh, the right fit. And Coach Gray, as we sign off, last question for everybody is how did wrestling change your life or what life lessons has the sport given you that are most pronounced in uh, your day-to-day now? Ah, wrestling made me who I am. You know, it taught me how to fight through adversity. It taught me what a, you know, a, a day's work is, what a hard day's work is. Um, you know, it made me who I am. It built, it built me 
um, you know, build me into the man I am today. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just can't be, I'm not, I can't, I can't be thankful enough for all the discipline and just, you know, all, all, all the things that I, I, I go through in my daily day that I don't even probably recognize <laughs> that wrestling did for me. You know, it just, it just really shaped me into the person I am today. And, uh, you know, I, I love wrestling as a sport. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a dork for the sport, but more than anything, I just love the things it does for people. It makes people better human beings. It teaches people, um, how to work hard and, you know, I'm a bit biased, but it's the greatest sport in the world. And all great things must come to an end. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, give us a review, give us a rating, and share this with your friends. It would mean the world to us. Thanks for listening to Wrestling Changed My Life.